Okay, welcome to today's session of Virtually Golden. My name is Annie and I work with um, Golden United. Just a little technical housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions at all for the presenter, just click the unmute button, which you'll find in the bottom left hand corner of your screen. Um, ask your question and then click the mute button again so that we don't have any background and uh, noise coming in. If um, you miss the presentation or if you want to share it with some friends later, it will be up and available on goldenunited.org and on our YouTube channel, um, which we link to in the, on Golden United. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. I'll be monitoring that. So if you have any technical problems, just put it in the chat box. Um, and other than that, I'm gonna hand it over to Kathy Smith, who's spearheading the Virtually Golden sessions. Kathy? Thanks so much, Annie. So today we hear about a timely topic from uh, Frank Blaha, the 1918 Great Influenza Pandemic. So uh, just about a hundred years ago, same, same sort of thing. So looking forward to hearing comparisons. Uh, Frank is an environmental engineer and has a strong interest in public health. He has a master's degree in civil and environmental engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a bachelor's degree from Northwestern University, and is a registered professional engineer in Colorado. As part of his education, the issue of community was front and center, where reading included books like John Snow's On the Mode of Communication of Cholera and Hans Zinser Gratz, Lice, and History. This background partly explains an interest in the great influence of 1918, but another key driver was his father, who was a survivor of the flu. Frank works at the Water Research Foundation, a nonprofit organization focused on advancing the science of water, where he's been employed for 24 years. Take it away, Frank. Thank you very much, and uh, pleased to be here. Thank you for your time. And I hope to provide you some useful information and uh, certainly uh, some interesting information uh, in covering the 1918 Great Influenza pandemic. Um, this first slide, I think, is, uh, has got a very indicative image of the 1918 flu and the intertwining of that flu with World War I. Um, and I'll, I'll say it's already been mentioned that my father had had the Spanish flu when he was a young man, just, well, a boy, 11 or 12 years old. And he told me and mentioned this a number of times that he was sick a long time. And of course, I was a kid when he was telling me this. So I interpreted a long time to be, oh, you know, two or three or maybe four days. Uh, and if you go into the 1918 influenza. Uh, and at the end of this presentation, I think you might have a different understanding of what a long time might be. My father had talked about how he thought he was going to die, and frankly, that he wanted to die because he was in so much pain from the flu when he was sick. Uh, he did comment on how people just died from it, like they were around one day and they'd be gone the next, or you know, a week later. Uh, they were gone. And even though he was uh, just a boy, he commented on societal disruption and how like society was uh, totally different and somewhat breaking down. And he was in the Chicago area, by the way, at that time. And certainly another aspect of the 1918 flu that was large in his mind was how little remembered it was. Uh, it was such a major event so many people died from it, and he felt like it was largely forgotten. And so he passed that on to me. And so I was uh, some willing ears when I was hearing about this uh, during one of my public health classes in college. And um, I've certainly done a lot more reading since then on uh, the great influenza pandemic. And I think it's just an extremely rich story. And it's got uh, so many different nuances and ties to what was going on and to some extent where we are right now. Uh, it's, it's just a very rich story. Anyway, I like this picture of this New York City street cop 
because I think this is truly indicative of the 1918 flu. Here we've got this uh, cop wearing a face mask, something that we've become very familiar with, and it's certainly an indicative image of the 1918 flu because many, many people, healthcare workers and others, uh, were wearing masks. It was required in many areas, not everywhere, but it was uh, uh, fairly common. Uh, you, you routinely see it. But what I really like about this picture is he's out there directing traffic, you know, cars coming by, uh, he's trying to avoid the flu and the signs on this little pole right next to him, stop and buy Liberty bonds, lend, uh, support, basically support the war effort. And I think that is truly indicative of the story of the, of the uh, 1918 flu for the United States. So this is frequently called the Spanish flu. And so we might as well just early on uh, address this name for the flu. Um, of course, this flu started in the spring of 1918, or it's commonly accepted to have started in the spring of 1918. There is some uncertainty about that. Uh, and at that time, World War I was still very much raging. So England, France, Germany, the United States, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, were, all of these countries were at war. And even though they were being impacted by the flu, they really didn't want open reporting of the flu because it could indicate that they might have reduced troop strength. They could have problems with leadership, whether in the military or uh, their political leaders. Uh, and also, if it was routinely talked about, it could distract from uh, the home front focus on the war. And so the fighting countries really did not want open reporting on the flu. They really didn't want to uh, detract from morale, either of their fighting men or from the home front. Spain, however, was neutral in World War I, so they weren't fighting. And uh, in the spring of 1918, in late May, the King of Spain was taken ill with the flu. And this was openly reported and it was extensively reported in the Spanish media. And of course, he was, you know, he was somewhat of a, uh, a celebrity figure. Uh, and so it was widely reported on and extensively reported on. And there were also members of his cabinet that wind, wound up ill with the Spanish flu or with, with the 1918 flu, my apologies. And so because it was so commonly reported in Spain and so little reported in other places, especially in our best neighbors and friends of the United States, and of course we were already in the war in the spring of 1918, because it was so extensively reported in Spain, people started calling it the Spanish flu. And oddly enough, Spain is one of the few countries that doesn't seem to try to lay claim to being the origination point for this flu. Um, so where did it start? Uh, there is not common agreement on this. It possibly started in Kansas. There's a couple of different origination points that are identified as places where it might've started in Kansas. Haskell County, Fort Riley, uh, Fort Funston, you know, different uh, military camps, the Camp Riley and uh, uh, Funston. Um, so that is commonly reported. There have been a couple of books that kind of put it uh, as a starting point in Kansas in early 1918. Possibly in Boston is another place that seems to have some uh, claim uh, to the origination point, possibly in China, France, England. Um, it, it's, it's, I, I would say it's not really certain exactly where it came from. They have been trying to reconstruct the virus and perhaps in the course of reconstructing that and doing further work on this virus that we may get some more insights into where it came from. There do seem to be some indications that possibly it was around even in 1917. Although again, I'll go back to commonly it's, it's identified as having uh, come about in the spring of 1918. Um, again, we've got another sign that uh, we're somewhat familiar with these days. Uh, all theaters were closed until further notice from the mayor. And I, I have to admit, I, I don't know what city this uh, particular little picture came from, but this was one of the common uh, methods of responding to the flu and uh, trying to minimize its spread. 
So uh, a few public health numbers and a little bit of discussion about public health in 1918. Uh, life expectancy has gone up a lot uh, since the turn of the 20th century. 1900, the average male was expected to live about 47 years. And this is the United States, by the way. Uh, and yet in 2018, it was 76 years. So a considerable increase in lifespan. Uh, similar numbers for females, 49 in 1900 was the expected average lifespan and 81 in 2018. The leading cause of death uh, at the turn of the 20th century was infectious disease. And uh, this was a time of great advances being made in uh, microbiology and in infectious disease control. Uh, you know, the idea of uh, the microbial theory of infectious disease dates to the 1850s. That's certainly what I learned in school, uh, reading John Snow on the mode of communication of cholera, uh, where he was studying a cholera outbreak in London. And he came up with this idea that the water was contaminated by these uh, microbes. And so he suggested that the pump on this well be taken off that seemed to be the epicenter of the outbreak. Uh, the, the pump was turned off. Uh, the outbreak of cholera subsided. It seemed to sort of make a bullseye around that well, one of the uh, first, probably the first epidemiological study that was ever done. The first epidemiological mapping that uh, we know of was done by John Snow in this cholera outbreak. And that seemed to be fairly good proof that this was uh, an idea worth believing a microbial theory of disease. But it was not immediately accepted. It still took years and years, although by 1918 it was uh, generally accepted. You know, the majority of people, I'm sure that there were still plenty of disbelievers at the time, but there were vast advances being made. The use of the light microscope was uh, widely, uh, was a significant tool in the advances of all of these microbiological uh, understandings and understanding of bacteria and some of the bacteria that cause things like cholera and typhoid and other infectious diseases. Uh, approximate population of the US in 1920 was about 106 million, so maybe 100 million uh, during uh, World War I. Anyway, around 100 million uh, was the US population at the time. Uh, by the 1950s, infectious disease rates had been reduced by about 90%. And a lot of this was due to better uh, nutrition, better hygiene, uh, and frankly, better water. So I'll put in a plug for the Water Research Foundation where I work, uh, you know, advancing the science of water. The influenza was already being studied by 1918 and using the light microscope and using uh, samples of people that had died from other influenza outbreaks there was some general understanding in the, um, in the microbiological community that they had found a causative agent of influenza, and that was a bacterium that they called Pfeiffer's bacillus. Uh, there was a major pandemic, actually, I believe, too, in the 1890s, but 1892 and 1893, there was a major pandemic of influenza, not as bad as the 1918, but uh, the 1890s, outbreak was uh, quite well known, quite noted. And so they had studied some of the people from that and subsequent outbreaks of influenza, which of course there's some flu every year. Um, there was one uh, difference in some of the effects or some of the responses to the influenza back at the time. There seemed to be a much greater focus in 1918 on sort of fresh air. So I thought that this this uh, sign about keeping your bedroom windows open to prevent influenza, pneumonia, and tuberculosis was sort of indicative of that. That seemed to be a much more common thread in 1918, whereas currently with our coronavirus, there's this social distancing that, that is sort of one of the common threads, you know, staying apart from people. And um, I, will, I will postulate that some of this emphasis on uh, clean air, on open windows, on being outside, was partly due to the previous theory of disease, the miasma theory of disease, that bad air caused diseases because people would get sick in swampy areas 
Uh, and so it was obviously due to the funny smells in the air. Uh, they'd get sick in, in other places where there were, uh, uh, where there was again, bad air. So there was this miasma theory that was, again, there would have still been a few people that were probably focused on miasma theory. In general, we'd come to the microbial theory of uh, infectious disease. But um, I, I think that there was still some vestiges of that with this emphasis on, on clean air, on fresh air, et cetera, et cetera. So a little bit of a difference from then to now. Uh, going back to 1918, did not really find much reference to social distancing, you know, trying to keep apart six feet or anything like that. There was a lot of emphasis on, on masks, uh, breathing through cloth or something to cover your face. Uh, it certainly can't help. It's probably not significantly helpful in preventing the 1918 flu because viruses are so, so small. So some World War I statistics. Of course, the war for the European powers uh, started in the summer of 1914, and the war ended on November 11th, 1918, with the signing of the armistice. Uh, rounding up, generally, uh, it's accepted that something like 20 million people died in the course of World War I. So a little over four years, uh, and that's including civilians, so that's uh, approximate total death toll. And again, it's an estimate. Uh, the United States entered the war in the spring of 1917, so we were a late entrant into the war. By the end of the war, we'd had just short of five million people serving uh, in the military, and our deaths in World War I were approximately 117,000, and a little bit less than half of those were from combat, the remainder were from disease. And so the 1918 flu would have been a good portion of those disease deaths for uh, the US Armed Forces. A few influenza statistics. Generally, the 1918 flu is considered to have gone in three waves, sort of a, a wave in the spring and summer of 1918. So uh, King Alfonso of Spain, uh, that was what he got in the spring of 1918. Uh, it, was largely gone through by the summer of 1919, but it was still petering, petering out even in 1920. So it was a long time till it was gone, if you will. Uh, again, the estimates of death vary and they are all estimates. One of the first estimates of total deaths from the 1918 flu was 21 million. So that was a, a study that came out in the early 1920s. Uh, more recently, there have been other estimates done, uh, and a lot of those are in the 50 to 60 million range. There are also people that come up with 100 million dead worldwide from uh, the influenza. The CDC, and a number of these images in this presentation come from the CDC website, and a number of my statistics come from the CDC website. The CDC estimate is that about 50 million were dead of the 1918 flu worldwide. Interestingly, about half of all of those deaths occurred in the second wave, which was September through December of 1918. And then the third wave was sort of late spring of 1918 through the summer, I'm sorry, late spring of 1919 through the summer of 1919. The CDC estimates estimates that we had about 675,000 Americans died of the 1918 flu. So if, if we, I'm gonna go back here, we had about 116 or 117,000 total deaths in World War I, and those weren't all due to combat, compared to 675,000 from the flu in 1918. So just like overall worldwide, there were many more people that died of the flu than of World War I. Similar statistics in the United States. This was a very deadly flu. Um, and uh, about half of the deaths occurred in those four months of September through December, 1918. So a very deadly fall. Uh, why were there so many dead? Well, unlike some of the other influenzas and, and even most since then, this particular strain of influenza, and it does mutate every year. So it's always a different flu every year. It generally has vestiges of previous years, but it keeps changing. This one was particularly dead, deadly to young adults. So exactly those sorts of people as you would fight, find in the fighting forces, you know, like late teens through their mid thirties. 
uh, the, the young, healthy population seemed to be particularly hard hit. It was notable. This flu, of course, also did kill the young and the old, but its impact on the young, super healthy adults was quite notable. Uh, one of the names for it, there, there were a couple of different um, slang names for it at the time. Purple death was one because a lot of the people basically suffocated. Uh, this influenza would attack their lungs. There have been studies, again, by CDC more recently as they've been trying to reconstruct this flu to see if it was attacking uh, other portions of the body, and it was pretty well focused on the lungs. It would attack the lungs and those healthy people with really strong immune systems. Their immune systems basically, if you will, would overreact to the infection and they would basically drown in their own fluids uh, and they'd asphyxiate and kind of turn purple and blue. And so one of the terms for it was the purple death. Another was the three day flu. So obviously some people uh, had this for uh, probably a relatively mild case uh, that was done in over in three days. The overall death rate for this particular flu, 1918, was approximately a 10% death rate of those that got it. This was, of course, widely variable. Cook County Hospital in Cook County, my home county in Illinois, they reported a mortality rate of 39.8% of the people that came and, and uh, visited their hospital. Now, of course, it was the very sick that would have wound up in the hospital, so that would not have been completely indicative of the death rate in Cook County, Illinois in general, but um, uh, quite a shocking statistic because that's, that's pretty deadly, 40% uh, of the people. Revic Mission in Alaska, this little community in Alaska, had 72 of 80 adults in the town die in five days from November 15th through November 20th of 1918. And this Brevik Mission kind of figures in uh, there was a whole storyline that I, I really don't have time to get into, but there was a whole storyline of reconstructing this flu and where some of the samples came from and some of the samples that were used in reconstructing the genetic code of this flu came from Brevig Mission in Alaska. Uh, and there's, there's a whole backstory there. Um, at the time in 1918, because there were people that were working in microbiology, they had seen that when people uh, got illnesses, they were frequently immune to it as they went forward, such as with smallpox, which smallpox is a viral disease. Um, there was a lot of time spent in 1918 trying to develop drugs and countermeasures. Uh, a lot of time and effort went into that. A lot of the health community was working on that. They came out with a few in the United States, you know, this is the cure. Uh, th we're going to inoculate our health workers with this first because we need them to take care of the sick folk. Uh, unfortunately, uh, none of them were successful at the time. So not unlike some of the efforts going on now to try to come up with a vaccine for our coronavirus. Um, we know a lot more right now. Uh, so we may be very much more successful. One can hope so. Uh, but there were certainly measures in 1918 uh, to try to combat this disease with some sort of a, a useful countermeasure other than taking care of the sick people. Um, None were successful, unfortunately. Um, so the influenza, it is a viral disease. And in 1918, while the existence of viruses was conjectured by some in the microbial field, uh, it took until 1933 uh, for the existence of viruses to be confirmed. Uh, and in fact, 1930, it was 1932 that I think the first patent on an electron microscope was uh, issued. And in 1933, an electron microscope was used to help verify viruses. Uh, bacteria were implicated with the 1918 flu. I mentioned the Pfeiffer's bacillus that they, you know, some of the microbiologists thought we had influenza by the tail because they knew the causative agent. But it turns out that was one, not, um, uh, that was a bacteria that was found in many uh, lung tissue samples, as had been found with other flus, uh, but it was not killing people. Uh, there were other bacteria that were found, but they were secondary infections. Uh, we didn't have any anti, uh, antibiotics at the time, nor antiviral medicines at the time. Again, there was work going on to try to uh, create those. This disease in 1918 was probably more deadly. One, it was a more deadly flu 
but there was also a generally lower level of nutrition. Our understanding of nutritional standards was, uh, uh, has advanced quite significantly uh, through the course of the 20th century, especially uh, in the mid of 20th century. And so, and especially with uh, food shortages and the like in World War I, in general, there was a lower level of nutrition for humankind uh, in 1918. And of course, just as has been a big concern with the coronavirus right now, certainly in 1918, medical systems were routinely overwhelmed. Lots of pictures of these outdoor hospitals and uh, tent hospitals and temporary hospitals, even as here in Denver, we're setting up stuff uh, uh, down in the um, convention center right now. Uh, in the United States, doctors and nurses were in short supply. So as people got sick, and severe cases of this illness were extremely debilitating uh, and, and people could not take care of themselves. So there were uh, apparently you know, real reports of like whole families um, dying together. And in some cases, uh, some of the you know, uh, people starved to death or died of dehydration because no one was there to take care of them and the disease is, and it was so debilitating uh, to the people that had more severe cases of it. Um, here in the United States, the severity of the disease and the um, infectivity of it was, was quite routinely downplayed. And this was a matter of us joining World War I. Woodrow Wilson, as you know, was, uh, you know, when he ran for his uh, reelection in 1916, one of his big platforms was that he kept us out of the war. And then shortly after he was reelected, we entered the war. But once we entered the war, Wilson took steps that we were going to be 110% committed to this war, no matter what. And uh, if you go back through some of the measures that were done in World War II, it certainly gave me a very different understanding of uh, Woodrow Wilson as a president. Um, you know, I always knew him associated with the League of Nations and trying to prevent future wars, but he wanted us absolutely committed to this war and he would really brook no no um, uh, opposing view. Uh, and so there was really no, any sort of organized domestic uh, federal action until December, 1918. So uh, post World War I, war was over for a month. So as this flu, especially the fall wave, the extremely deadly fall wave was going through the country, uh, actions were taken at the state and the local level. They were frequently late and frequently spotty um, and um, uh, of course, as we now are all living through it, actions taken to prevent its spread were costly. It, it disrupted society. I can understand my father commenting on that, uh, given what we're living through right now. And also, it appears that frequently the actions were ended too early, and then there were subsequent deaths, even if you might have dodged a bullet initially. So, um, I mentioned there was going to be no argument about World War I once the United States entered it. And this is just part of this rich story, I think, behind the influenza, the 1918 influenza. The American Protective League was created in the spring of 1917, uh, and it was an adjunct to the Justice Department. This, these were badged volunteers that were part of the Justice Department. They were to help the United States with counterintelligence, so they were seeking out spies, and they were also uh, you know, domestically trying to identify unpatriotic behavior. And so what was unpatriotic? Well, it was a whole slew of things, but not buying or not buying enough war bonds was definitely unpatriotic. By the end of the war, they had about two, a quarter of a million volunteer members uh, that were reporting to a very small justice department. They sometimes operated and brought their unpatriotic behavior to the attention of courts. But sometimes they took more direct action, like sometimes it was just a good idea to beat someone. Uh, and you really didn't want to be identified as a slacker, which was a term very much in evidence in 1918 and during our time in World War I. A slacker was uh, quite an epithet at the time. You did not want to be identified as a slacker. So the American Protective League. So here's a little, uh, I, I found this on an internet search about a slacker who was uh, uh, doused in a barrel of paint because he wasn't buying uh, Red Cross war fund uh, bonds. And um, what was interesting 
the caption for this was, uh, there was something about APL in the caption, so American Protective League. And um, uh, this was very much during the war, as you'll see, this is dated September 6th, so September 6th, 1918. So we were in the war, and this guy was an Austrian, so probably of questionable, uh, uh, questionable loyalty because Austria was on the other side. Um, but um, he was shown what not buying uh, some bonds uh, could do, not buying some Red Cross war fund bonds could do for him. There were also four Minutemen, uh, another interesting story. Uh, also in the spring of 1917, uh, by executive order, the Committee on Public Information was created, and the CPI was a propaganda agency. It was to sustain morale. It was to promote voluntary press censorship. So they encouraged people not to report on the flu, um, but there's more on that soon. They were also there to promote the selling of war bonds, to promote victory gardens and other things that would help us win the war. Um, George Creel was named the head of uh, the uh, Committee on Public Information. And I, I had to mention George Creel because he had Denver ties. He worked at the Denver Post, the Rocky Mountain News, and he was even a Denver police commissioner. Under the CPI, he created a number of divisions, but he created the Four Minute Men Division. And by the end of the war, they had 75,000 volunteers and they spoke at theaters, fellowship halls and other meeting places and other events. And the idea of these four minute men was one that was considered to be sort of the attention span of humans at the time. Two, they were promoting the war. Three, that was the amount of time it took to change reels in a movie theater. So four minute men were there to promote the war, uh, to uh, minimize anything that would uh, decrease uh, the home front morale, et cetera. So it was uh, another uh, uh, agency to 110% make sure that we were focused on the war. And finally, there's the Espionage Act of 1970 and the Federal Sedition Act of 1918. When the Federal Sedition Act of 1918 was signed, it became illegal to utter, print, write, publish, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous or abusive language about the government of the United States. And you'll notice there's nothing there about that being a lie. So even if it was true, uh, this was now illegal. There were substantial legal, or there were substantial monetary uh, and prison terms associated with doing any of this, even if it was true. And of course you could get both. And people went to jail for saying things like, I think this, food, um, you know, the, the, this food, oh God, it wasn't food rationing, uh, but I think this is stupid. Even if he was drunk in a bar and he said that, one man in Montana went to jail. Montana did have a more, uh, even a more severe uh, Sedition Act in 1918 than the Federal Sedition Act, but um, people went to prison for this and some of them stayed in prison for years by uttering anything against the government of the United States or against World War I. And newspapers were referenced by the American Protective League to the Justice Department for reporting too honestly about the influenza pandemic. So there was a real damping down of discussion of the flu, of getting ready for the flu, even as people might, you know, if you will, see it coming. Uh, and, and some of this was by design, American Protective League, the CPI, uh, and, you know, just frankly, that was where we were. Both the American Protective League and CPI, they encouraged neighbors to report on neighbors. And so it was, it was kind of um, uh, a very un-American period in America. Um, and all tied to World War I and all allowing the pandemic to be worse than it might otherwise have had to have been. So um, how can we really understand that? I would like to suggest a novella of a, a less than 100 pages. It's maybe uh, 60 or 70 pages long by Catherine Ann Porter. It's semi-autobiographical. It's set in Colorado, so what could be better? Uh, Catherine Ann Porter worked at the um, Rocky Mountain News for a while, and so this story is set in Colorado. There's a very clear description of what it was like living in World War, during World War I and how it dominated all aspects of our life in 1918. You get an idea from her description in this book, again, what it was like if you didn't buy enough war bonds and, and how much you might be pursued and hounded. 
Um, and there is a description that goes on for 15 or 16 pages in this book of her personal experience being sick with the flu. And um, it, it's, it's a very interesting description. She very well describes sort of the delirium and the pain and the twisted thoughts that one has. And it went on for her for weeks. And it made an appearance in a number of her books. She was a relatively prolific writer, number of books and short stories. Uh, and she had a, a vastly interesting life. Uh, and for her, there were life-changing results. Uh, in the book, or in this novella, Pale Horse, Pale Rider, she talks about her getting sick and goes through all of these pages. She gets sick at home. She's eventually taken off to a hospital where, she's, um, where she eventually recovers. And then when she's recovered uh, and she's trying to find out what happened, her boyfriend was instrumental in getting her off to the hospital. And she recovers to discover that her boyfriend has been dead for over a month. So she was sick for weeks. So that certainly gives me a different understanding of what a very long time might have meant for my father, who was sick with the flu. Anyway, Pale Horse, Pale, Gr Pale Rider, it's a great read. And um, uh, the life of Catherine Ann Porter is really very interesting. Um, a life-changing result that she had uh, when she was recovering from the flu, uh, when she kind of regained her senses and everything, uh, she'd lost all of her hair. And when her hair grew back, it all came back white. And so for the rest of her life, she had white hair. And it's my understanding that her fiance died of the 1918 flu. So again, this pale horse, pale rider is semi-autobiographical uh, from her life, living through the 1918 flu and being a survivor. So Golden, what happened here in Golden? Um, Golden instituted a meeting ban. Uh, there were some discussions at the state level and particularly in Denver, you know, this Denver city in September of 1918, because if you will, they, they could see the flu coming. Golden Institute of Meeting Ban on October 7th, 1918. It was a Monday. That's when they closed the schools, churches, et cetera, clubs, lodges, pool halls, movie houses, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, they banned pretty much all meetings. Um, in Denver, it was two or more people. And I put that two or more people here for Golden. And I'm not sure that that's strictly true. So, um, uh, but they were definitely uh, discouraging all meetings, uh, fraternity and lodge meetings were not to take place. Sick were to be quarantined, anyone taking care of the sick were to be quarantined. And again, this issue of ventilation, buildings with poor ventilation were to be closed. And um, I'd be curious to know if there were any buildings here in town that were closed. This seems to have been fairly successful, it went on for a number of weeks. Uh, there were a number of cases of the flu at the Industrial School for Boys, which is now the Lookout Mountain School. So that's still with us. But uh, the general population of Golden uh, had a, a few instances of the flu, but not very many. So as it turns out, they lifted the ban at the end of the day on November 10th, and November 11th turned out to be Armistice Day. And so there was much jollification in the streets of Golden. There were throngs. And then in late November, Golden had a major outbreak of the flu. Meeting ban was reinstated. And the armory building that I'll assume most of you are familiar with, first one floor and then pretty much the whole building was turned over to temporary use of a hospital being staffed by Red Cross people. And the Red Cross in a number of uh, cities really stepped up and, and there's a whole other story there. Um, finally, the meeting ban was lifted on January 4th. So in the case of Golden, um, we had, eh, you know, more or less uh, October, November and December, a meeting ban and people kind of encouraged to stay at home. Uh, and there's good coverage of some of the specifics of deaths and et cetera in Golden in an article, The Great Flu Epidemic by Richard Gardner in edition 39 of uh, the 2018 Historically Jeff Coe magazine. And that is online. It's a little hard to find, but you can find that online. And he's got about a, th a three or four page article with a number of specifics on, on the flu here. But they had um, meeting and sort of uh, you know limited travel encouraged for three months here in Golden, and we didn't really dodge the bullet. Gunnison, Colorado was fairly successful in avoiding the fall uh, flu. Uh, their paper was pretty uh, outspoken uh, reporting on the flu. They started reporting on it in late September uh, 1918, 
and then it was basically front page uh, news every week through the end of January. Uh, they went on a ban on Tuesday, October 8th, so one day later than us. Uh, and again, there was some of this at the, at the state level where the governor was encouraging people to do these sorts of things. Uh, but in the end of October in Gunnison, they went on a strict quarantine. So they put up roadblocks. Uh, they were monitoring trains that were coming through the area. Uh, they arrested people and anyone that was coming into uh, the area was going to be uh, put in quarantine for two days. And this, this flew at the time. It was, um, it, it was fairly fast acting. So people were, um, you know, frequently, uh, they came down sick very quickly or they could. And it seems that Gunnison was fairly successful in avoiding the fall wave of the flu. They reopened their schools in late January. They uh, lifted the, you know, kind of the uh, quarantine on February 5th, 1919. Seemed like they dodged a bullet. And the third wave of the flu caught them in the spring of 1919 when they got 100 cases and five deaths in the spring of 1919. So again, it was around for quite a while. It was you know, generally accepted to have been a year-long pandemic. Uh, and here Gunnison seems to have successfully avoided the, the, the real impacts of the fall wave, uh, but got caught by the spring 1919 wave. And with that, um, there's many additional interesting stories to tell, uh, but I'll entertain questions. Okay, so if you have a question, just click the unmute button in the bottom left hand corner of your screen and go ahead and dive in. Frank, this is Bob Stores. I'm curious, what do you see as how, what caused the flu to come to an end? In other words, okay, in end of 1919, 1920, the flu kind of went away, but what? You know, what causes that? What's well, going to cause that with the current flu? Well, you know, that, that, that's an excellent question. And, and that's, that's one that I, I hadn't thought about a lot. Uh, but the flus do, um, you know, they, they mutate, they change. And so I am sure that there was some degree of it changing. And then also, you know, it went through and got about um, infected about like uh, a third of the human population. And so it probably started to, you know, um, the more susceptible people found fewer people to be transmitted to as well. And so partially started to die out because again, there was, there appeared to be some immunity from people that had had it, uh, that they did not uh, get a second case of it. And how long that lasted and some of those other questions that are very much with us now, I don't believe there are good answers fully for the 1918 flu. Uh, but again, CDC and, and others have been uh, doing a lot of studies on some reconstructed, um, you know, versions of the 1918 flu. Um, but I, I'm going to go with uh, partly losing, uh, you know, a susceptible population and some changes in its in its um, uh, genetic codes. Uh, but I'll, I'll have to look at that, and I, I may need to come back at you with perhaps a different answer if I if I discover CDC and others. Um, uh, have a wealth of knowledge on that that I'm unaware of. But that is an excellent question. I should have seen that one coming. Yeah. Thank you. Frank, we had a question in the chat from Michelle Poulet. She says, was there a library at that time and was it open or closed? I don't think folks had a whole lot of extra cash to spend on books, did they? Um, a library, was there a library? And a little bit of context in the chat, they're talking about how uh, the internet is so important to share um, information um, and how books were the resource at the time. Yes, well, actually, the, that, that's, that is an interesting question. To be absolutely honest, I don't know if we had a public library here. And I'm thinking that perhaps we did not at the time in Golden in 1918, but I, I don't, I don't truly really know the answer there, but it is interesting with our current um, shutdown or what, what you, you know, uh, only essential travel uh, restrictions on, or, you know, restrictions on travel and with our library being closed, I did want to go and revisit some of my references on this. And in fact, 
Rats, Lice, and History, which was one of the books that was mentioned in my um, sort of my bio as introduction here. I couldn't find my copy of it recently. I, I, I wanted to find that book and uh, I was looking for some quotes out of that book for this presentation because uh, that was one of the books that my uh, prof in, in undergrad highly recommended. You know, oh, you, you should all read this book. And he, he'd say that like two or three times in a lecture. And I wish I'd written all of those down because the ones I did and the ones that I followed up on, they were all excellent reads. And it has been interesting. Um, I have at least been somewhat impacted in kind of preparing for this uh, in getting some of the hard copy references that I uh, would have liked to have gone back and referenced. I'd done some earlier versions of this presentation for other, uh, for other purposes. And I have not seen uh, in a lot of the firsthand accounts, you know, like Catherine Ann Porter, she was sick for weeks and weeks. Uh, other people um, might have had milder cases. Some people, uh, firsthand accounts, talk about, you know, how, how people could die in 24 hours, and that certainly did happen uh, with the 1918 flu. I don't recall very many people comment, I don't recall any people commenting on uh, some of the social isolation measures, and I would have thought that would have made more of an impression and left more of a record than at least I found, because that's been very significant with this current coronavirus outbreak. And as I say, I, I've been, you know, personally impacted by not being able to go get some of these references that were available through our uh, interlibrary loan at the library. Um, and I will uh, find a specific answer as to when our public library was created. I think it came after 1918. That's an excellent question. Wonderful. Do we have any more questions today? If so, just click the unmute button and dive in and otherwise we'll wrap it up pretty soon. I've got a quick question, Frank. Uh, how much bigger was the second wave than the initial wave of deaths? from the flu? Um, that, that is a good question. Uh, one of the st statistics was that the second wave, uh, as opposed to the first and the third waves, seemed to be uh, more contagious, so it was more easily transmitted, and it was more deadly. And um, gosh, uh, there are charts of death rates from the flu uh, in 1918, and I'm trying to remember just how those graphs looked, but I would say that it was, it seemed like there was about a quarter of all of the deaths from the flu in that first wave, which went on for more than four months, uh, and about a, a similar number in that third wave. So, um, you know, those two waves put together, let's say, let's say this was just a total of one year, the two waves put together had about eight months, the first and the third wave of deaths. So that was about half of the deaths and then about twice as many uh, as that in those four months of the fall of 1918. Um, so, you know, about like 325,000 deaths in the fall in the United States uh, of 1918 from that second wave. So maybe about 150, 160,000 in the first and the third waves. Uh, but but there was some good charting of that done in the early 1920s um, uh, in some of the uh, you know post reconstruction of the 1918 flu because they did want to understand how this um, pandemic was transmitted. They wanted to understand it and try to prevent against it and try to identify good measures to prevent future occurrences of a similar uh, pandemic. Okay, All do right. we have any more questions today? If not, um, just a little more housekeeping and a nice reminder that this will be available on the Golden United YouTube channel and on goldenunited.org later today. So if you want to share this presentation with any of your friends, feel free to do so. We do have virtually golden sessions scheduled through May 5th. And if you visit the goldenunited.org website, you'll be able to see our upcoming presenters there. Kathy, do you have anything to wrap up before we finish up today? 
I just wanted to mention that Thursday's talk is going to be about uh, recreational impacts on Clear Creek water chemistry by Jim Ramville, who's a mines professor. Wonderful. Um, join us again on Thursday, same time, same place. We'll be here at noon. And thank you all so much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye.